Welcome to Backstage with Richard Ridge. We are once again at the legendary Sardis, and my guest is one of Broadway's newest leading ladies. She's appeared in such shows as Rent, Hairspray, Wicked, Hair, Les Mis, and Ghost. And now she is back on Broadway as everyone's favorite ice queen, Elsa, in Disney's smash hit musical Frozen. Please welcome Casey Levy. We are sitting here at Sardi's. Your theater is right next door to St. James, where you are, you are so sensational in Frozen, I have to tell you. I think I told you that opening night. You know, the last time we spoke was opening night. What was that whole day like for you? Opening was crazy. Opening night is always crazy. Yeah. Um, and exciting and, and nerve-wracking and just so much emotion because you sort of arrived at the night that is the celebration yeah. and the critics have come and gone and your family is out there and everyone's got their cute outfits and so it's it's a lot of feelings um, and this one in particular was just so massive I mean our our show is so loved and yeah. our like Frozen itself is so loved that there was a lot of you know hype and expectation but that night I think mostly just felt like a celebration because we had kind of gotten over the the major hurdles sure and it was sort of just for us and for the community to celebrate. And it was a blast. I got to wear a really pretty dress. You had a gorgeous <laughs> dress that night. Thank you. Yeah, Zach Posen lent me yeah. something totally beautiful that I never wanted to take off. And so, I, you know, I just felt really special and happy. And it was nice to be able to do the show for my parents and my family out there. And, um, and then see, actually see them at the party. I managed yeah. to do that. You know, sometimes you don't ever, ever see anybody you, sure. you know at the party. So it was such a, a fantastic party, and I got to really spend time with them, which was great. What a way to return to Broadway. I mean, you're playing Elsa. Yeah, it's nuts. Yeah. Um, it's pretty great. I mean, I this is my first Broadway show in two years, I want to say, because I have my son, and I was pregnant with him while I was doing a show off-Broadway at the Public Theater. Which one? That was first Daughter yes. Suite. So, um, and actually he, I remember <laughs> I was um, passed out in that piece, it was a very dark piece, um, about the Reagans, and I was, like, I had this sort of, like, seizure moment. I passed out, and that was the moment that Isaiah kicked for the first time. Oh, wow. It was when I was on stage, and just had, like, a single tear. So now to be, <laughs> my, to have my next moment on stage um, be when he's two years old, it's just such, like, so much life has happened Sure, to me. yes. And so it's been really cool to get back on stage in, in such a massive show and, and be back on Broadway. As a, as a mom and as sort of like a new person, really. What's it like living in this incredible world that Disney has created? No one puts a show on like Disney. Yeah, they are wonderful. Yeah. I don't know what I expected. I think I thought that it would feel kind of um, corporate to work for Disney. I think that's what most people think. And I've come to realize it's not that at all. Um, Tom Schumacher and Ann Court, yeah. who run Disney Theatricals, are there with us every single day. They were there through tech, through Denver. They moved to Denver. They moved their families out there. And they text us and they call us. And they're just such an um, available team of producers in a way that I've actually never had before. And so that sort of trickles down. And everybody is just very not precious. Um, Michael Grandage was similarly accessible to us and just had such a connection with him as my director. I trusted him so much. And so this whole process of like working for Disney and doing this huge Elsa in Frozen has also felt pretty much like an art house piece in a lot of ways for me as an actor. And that has been so unexpected to, to do something so well known, so loved with a lot of pressure around it, and also feel really creatively satisfied and supported. That has been amazing. Of course, what I love the most is you were able to find your own Elsa and make her your own. Yes, I really was. That's, yeah. That was a sort of a condition that they had for whoever they cast to play this part. They wanted someone to bring themselves to it. And I absolutely feel that I've had the chance to do that. And sort of by being who I am um, and the kind of actor that I am and the kind of person that I am, I've brought just those innate qualities to the role. and found a sort of mashup of, of myself and Elsa, and I think it's, it's been really wonderful as well with all the new material to be able to put my own stamp on that. Yeah. Um, and they absolutely wanted me to do that. They wanted me to run with it. And um, I've learned a lot in the process about just, not just the role, but like myself as an actor. 
Yeah. Working with Michael Grandage on this and those iconic songs. Yes. I mean, you have the iconic song. Yes. I mean, let it go. <laughs> but you talked through this with your director. I mean, you both worked on this really hard to make this your own. And you just like, the closing of the first act is sensational. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, there was a lot of conversation yeah. about let it go because you want to give the people what they want, but you want to make it its own thing. Um, there's no reason to do the Broadway show unless it is a new incarnation of this story. And especially with Let It Go closing the first act, you know, the pressure's on and we want to make it spectacular. But uh, uh, the major sort of nugget that we kept coming back to, um, Michael Grandage and I, was that it, the song can't get bigger than the show. Yeah. And, and actually, I remember we talked a little bit about this back in Les Mis time, because yeah. when I was playing Fontaine and singing I Dreamed a Dream and Anne Hathaway had just won the Oscar, there was like so much pressure around that song as well. And it, it's a similar type of thing where... You want to recognize and acknowledge that you are the person that gets to sing this incredible piece of music that people love and know so well, but you also have an honor and a duty to make it authentic and keep it in the story. And so we did a lot of work on just the lyrics and beat by beat and how much is too much around me scenically yeah. and how much is not enough and sort of treading that line and figuring out that balancing act. And it, it's changed quite a lot. In Denver, we had sort of one version of Let It Go visually um, that we tweaked pretty much almost, yeah, we almost changed everything about yeah. Let It Go for Broadway and just like bumped it up even more. Um, but it all came from the story of the song and from this girl experiencing what she's experiencing in that moment. So I think that's why it, so impactful for the yeah. show and I think that's why people happily love it so much every night because it's supported by the story it's not like a karaoke fest yeah. you know no I love how you were able to flesh her out and make her this beautiful full all the emotions that you put into your Elsa in this show thanks well and I've, I've had the opportunity yeah. with this, the, the new songs to those are terrific they're really yeah. I think especially the material I've received I have two new songs around let it go that I think me, make Let It Go mean more, because now we have a song in the first act, Dangerous to Dream, where we get to see Elsa grappling with all of the anxiety and the worry and the stress of becoming queen, and can she be this person that her community needs her to be, and longing for her sister and feeling yeah. so alone and isolated. And in the movie, we just get that in a close-up. It's just, you know, 10 seconds, and we can't do that on stage. And yeah. so to have a song there that the audience can really relate to Elsa on and really understand what it is she's feeling and why she's doing what she's doing, I think makes Let It Go mean so much more by the time we get there. When did you know you could sing? How old were you? It's funny, I always sang around the house. My family is very musical. All our home videos are us singing songs yeah. and doing dances and stuff. But. My dad used to tuck me in at night. He, he sort of, because he was a doctor for many years, he just um, retired, so he's still a doctor, but not practicing now. And he was gone all day until late at night. So he was usually just coming in when I was going to sleep. And so our special thing was he would tuck me in and he would sing to me. And we would harmonize. Till There Was You, that was one of the standards. Like a lot of old yeah. standards. Till There Was You, Sunny Side of the Street, Catch a Falling Star, you know those ones? Classics. Yeah, so he listened to the oldies at yeah. his office and then he would come home with those songs in his head and sing those to me. And I think that's my real first memory of singing was, was learning how to harmonize with him. And uh, So how old were you then? Oh gosh, I was five, six. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, and he's also, my mother played piano for many, many years and sort of was forced to do it as a child and is an excellent pianist. And then my father literally couldn't tell you what key is what, but he can sit down and play anything. It's sort of like Savanti. So um, the music was just part of our lives, and, and I think I always sang after that. And I was a little bit shy about it. Like, I would sometimes sing, my, sing myself to sleep, but I would be, like, shy if my mom was walking by in the hallway and heard me. She'd be like, Casey, go to sleep. And I'd be like, oh, God. But yeah, music has just been the constant throughout yeah. my life. And now you star on Broadway. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty great. <laughs> so when your love for the theater, were you like eight years old and how did Free to Be You and Me yeah, sort of play so, into this? So my brothers, I have two older brothers, Josh yeah. and Roby, and they were in the theater and, um, and also like playing sports and doing lots of other things, but I just wanted to be like them. So I wanted to do all the things they did. I was like, hey, wait for me, wait for me. And so I got into theater as well because I was singing all the time. Yeah. And um, there was a community theater production of Free to Be You and Me. And I got cast as the, the little girl who's bossy, who says, ladies first, ladies first, which was good casting at that age. I was a little bit bossy. And, uh, and I don't know, I got on stage in front of people. And 
and something sort of switched for me. And I, re I remember rehearsing the lines with my mom and being really nervous, but as soon as I got on stage, I didn't have any of those nerves. I was just sort of free, for yeah. lack of a better word. And uh, I never sort of looked back after that. It was like, when's the next time I can do something like that? You came to New York and auditioned for AMDA yes. on a whim, right? Yeah, I was going to go study Shakespeare in yeah. Canada. I, I'm from just outside Toronto, as you know, and I, uh, I sang in bands a lot in high school, and then I did plays, and so I just assumed I was going to be a serious actor. None of those musicals for me. <laughs> and I would go study Shakespeare, and so that's what I auditioned for, and I was set to go, but a, a teacher in the music program at my high school who had heard me sing from time to time said, you know, there's this school, and they, they travel around, and they do these auditions, and it's in New York, and I know you love New York and Broadway, and I thought, oh, well, I, I guess I should go to that audition, and I went, and when I got in, <laughs> I, I called my brother, Roby, who's always been a basketball player, and he was like, dude, you got into the NBA. <laughs> you have to go, and I was like, right, New York is like the NBA, and especially to me, Hamilton, Ontario, Canada is yeah. like a small, you know, it's actually quite a big city now, but when I was growing up, it felt much smaller, and I thought, okay, I guess I'm going to move to New York and, and give this a go and see what happens. But you sort of, you booked shows right away. The first big show you booked was Rent, right? Yes, the tour? Yes. Maureen? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, that sort of changed your life with the did. people you got to meet, right? Yeah, it did. Because I was, you know, I knew like four musicals when I showed up for drama school to study musical theater. I knew Rent. Yeah. I knew Les Mis. I knew what the Phantom of the Opera was, but I knew that wasn't my voice type, so I didn't really know the music. Um, <laughs> Gosh, what else? I had heard of Cats because yeah. I saw it when I was eight. Didn't get it at all, but was like super into it. So you didn't want to be a cat. Yeah, well, I wasn't a dancer. Yeah. I, I was like a, a mover, a solid yeah. mover. So I was like, I'm not doing all of that insanity, but it's cool, and like glad I saw it. So, but yeah, and so I, when I showed up to to school, I, I was learning about all these obscure musicals and stuff from the 40s and 50s, and but really I was like singing Rent in the mirror at home, and then to, for that to be my first job wow. was really insane. So they were auditioning for the Non Equity Tour, and I was very um, ambitious and very tenacious with my auditioning. So I would go and line up yeah. every day at 6 a.m. and wait to sing 16 bars, and that's how I booked that job. Is is I think about six months of me going to open calls, trying to just get in front of anybody who would see me. Because I knew that you just had to put yourself out there. And I think also being foreign and not having, um, you know, having my time in the, in the States be on a clock made me really be like, okay, now or never. Like, there's no waiting around. There's no Joe jobs. Like, my job is to yeah. get on stage. And so I sort of willed that into existence. And then I was on tour as Maureen when I was 21, you know, on a bus and truck tour. I had a suitcase and a cell phone bill, and that was it. <laughs> and uh, life was so cool. Yeah. It was, it, you know, we were playing one-nighters all over the place and eating lunch at Subway every day because that was on, the, was on the side of the highway. And it was, it couldn't have been better. It was amazing. While you were playing Penny on Broadway in um, Hairspray, yeah. you started dating someone, didn't you? Uh, yes, yes, I did. I started dating my husband. Okay. <laughs> Tell everybody who your husband is. Yeah, me. I know. Who was I dating then? Yeah, I was like, oh. My I don't know. Who was I dating? So, my husband's David Reeser. We've been together a very long time um, 11 years almost. And uh, he was I, doing good vibrations. Yes, he was doing good vibrations yeah. on Broadway, and I was doing Hairspray in Toronto, the original company there. Got it. So, our paths didn't really cross. And then the Toronto company of Hairspray closed, and I went on the tour. And the girl playing Amber, her name's Worth Williams, <laughs> she was like, I have the perfect boy for you that you need to meet. And I was like, oh, okay, I don't know. I'm, we're on the road. You know, I was on that tour for 18 months, a very long time. And, uh, and she was like, well, when you get off tour, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set you up with him. And sure enough, <laughs> after we got off tour, she took me to one of his gigs. He's a singer-songwriter yeah. and, and um, was playing out at, at, I think it was Hurley's, actually, in Midtown. And I heard him play, and I was like, okay, I have to meet this boy. Because, you know, boys and guitars and singing, it's just it's a weakness. And, um, and yeah, we, we just hit it off, and then we broke up and got back together and broke up and got back together, you know, what you do yeah. when you're 25. And then, um, but I, I did realize pretty early on, like, oh, this but is But he the was person. the one? Yeah, I knew by the third date that I was going to marry him. Now, jump ahead. 
happily married. You have a beautiful son. Yeah, two? No. Oh, yes, he's, yeah, he's two. I was like, right? I don't have two sons. Yes. <laughs> Not yet. One son, he's two years old. Yes. Isaiah. Isaiah. So has the musical DNA in both of your families, both of your sons, oh, yeah. rubbed off on him? This is a musical kid. Yeah, okay. He, um, yes. He came out singing, basically. He, um, he was premature. We had a very complicated pregnancy. And he, his stomach wasn't fully developed, and yeah. he was in the hospital for about a month. And so he had a lot of like guttural sounds going at the beginning, like a lot of uh, uncomfortable for about three months. And that segued into him just never not speaking or singing. So he's, um, he's singing all the songs yeah. these days. He's in a, like a run around the room clapping mode. Yeah. He really likes if you're happy and you know it. He's really into let it go. Yeah. Fully sings all of that. I can't believe he gets the intervals perfectly. Yeah. His pitch is amazing. Do you rehearse at home? Do you, do you do you like warm up at home before you go to the theater? I warm up a yeah. little bit at home. I sort of warm up throughout the day. So okay. I wake up and I do some humming and I'm just like awake for a little while and then I do sort of another little section in the afternoon, which he's usually around yeah. for. So I say, I say, you gonna warm up with me? And I go, eee! and he busts out laughing and then <laughs> does it as well. He just thinks it's hilarious. Because <laughs> you have this killer voice. I mean, you have this voice. I don't know where your voice comes from. I, I don't know yeah. either. My voice has evolved, you know? Yeah. Like, it's so interesting when people are like, oh, you have this huge voice and you've played all these powerhouse roles. And I yeah. have. But I don't know that I like, think of myself that way. I, the way I sing is is so, like, part of the way I, who I am. Yeah. That I don't separate it that much, so I don't give it a lot of thought, other than that I, I care for my voice pretty uh, severely. I'm, I'm pretty, like, nun-like when it comes to my voice, but um, I do I do have, like, an access to some power, and but I really also enjoy using the lighter side of my voice, and actually that's been something that's really awesome about Elsa and the new material they wrote. Yeah. Dangerous to Dream, I get to do a lot of, like, this flippy, softer, folky singing that I love, love, love to do. Um, and then I get to unleash a little bit and let it go. And then I get to unleash even more in Monster. But I think it allows us to see some of her vulnerability and some of her power at the same time, often in the same musical phrase. And yeah. that's the kind of thing, like, as a singing nerd that I really, really love. You played Alphaba in Wicked. Was mm -hmm. it opposite Megan Hilty? Yeah. Yeah, we did that together in L.A. So yeah. you started out there. I actually started here as the understudy. I love how this all works. You started all these different places, you know understudies what? and this, tracks. This and... is the story of my career. And actually, this is why I like talking to people, young people who are yeah. just starting out, is that I have worked my way up. Yeah. I was not someone who got out of college and got handed the plum Broadway yeah. roles. I started as an understudy. I started in the ensemble. I was on a non-equity tour. Then I got to Broadway after a year in Toronto with Hairspray and 18 months on tour where I was in the ensemble, then promoted to Penny. Then I got brought to Broadway as Penny. You know, I'm playing the long game. Yeah. And um, I think it's made me a way better actor and company member because I understand how vital it is to, you know, to be an understudy in a company. is such a powerful, important role. And they don't get the notoriety that the leads always get, but they're so important. Um, and those are the jobs you should be taking. That's yeah. what I'm often telling people. Just take it, learn, say yes to things. Actually, that's a Gavin Creolism. He's always yeah. like, let's say yes, you know, let's be open. Um, and good things will come if you put that work in and if you're a good person and a good company member and you show up every day. And So yeah, for me, it's really been, it's been the long game. And Wicked is another example of that where I finished playing Hairspray on Broadway and I knew I wanted to be in that green girl costume. I was, you know, had my eye on it like everybody else in the city. And they initially saw me for Glinda, actually, because I'm blonde. Yeah. And I was like, oh gosh, I'm not Glinda. And they were like, well, just my agent at the time was like, just go in and like wear a party dress. And I was like, okay. So I put on some terrible prom dress. And I went in and attempted to sing, let us be glad. But it didn't sound that good, and it's much higher. It sounded like a lot of air. And they were like, oh, okay, so you're not Glinda. Let's have you leave and come back in. Have a look at the alphabet stuff. And I was like, okay, good. That's where I want to be. And so I got cast as the understudy. And I was there for a year. Julia Murney, who's brilliant, yeah. was playing alphabet at the time. And then just as I had gotten um, cast to go to L.A. and replace Eden, Espinosa, um, Stephanie Block was coming into Broadway. So she, I saw her first five shows before I left to take over the role opposite Megan in L.A. Do you remember the first time you went green? I sure do. I, yeah, and actually this is, this is all thanks to Lisa Brescia, really, because yeah. she was the standby for Julia. And she, Julia had booked a vacation, and Lisa, 
um, was the standby, so she was going to go on for all the shows, and she advocated to the company for me to get two matinees, which was incredibly classy, and I will forever be indebted to her. And so I, I had two scheduled shows, and I went on, and the whole creative team saw me, and it was right after that that they said, you know, do you think you could do this full time? And I was like, I think so. I hope so. <laughs> and that's what started the wheels in motion. Um, so you got to pay it forward and share share the lot. Yeah. You know, like that was a good lesson in that. Lisa taught me that. Sheila and Hayer. I'll I'll never forget sitting at that theater numerous numerous times watching you make your magic on stage in that show. That was, was that surreal? Like doing that show? Yeah. That was like. That's a career highlight yeah. and, a, and a life highlight. That show, I always felt like I should have been born in the 60s. Yeah. I feel like a bit of a flower child anyways, and that's my music. And it's like Bob Dylan, Joni Mitchell, that's where I live. And so to be cast in this revolutionary role, this strong woman who goes to D.C. and leads this tribe in this revolution was really amazing for me. And um, and that tribe of actors who are my family, who are still to this day some of my closest friends, that made it so much more magical. But the, you know, the message of the show was so important. And at that time, we were fighting for marriage equality. We sure. went to DC as a cast. They canceled our show. Oscar Eustace and our producers canceled our show, which I've never heard of. Took a huge financial hit so that we could go do the right thing. That was amazing. Um, we were really, you know walking the walk off stage yeah. that we were preaching on stage and so it meant a lot to all of us and singing easy to be hard was amazing it was um and and good morning starshine and i believe in love and uh, that was a real breakout moment for me too because it was my first time on broadway creating a part and um, being seen in the community as a real leading lady not just replacing but but someone who they could bring on to create something and so that felt like a real huge opportunity for me because you took the show to London, but you sort of stayed in London because you're the ghost over there. Yeah, yeah. So that was also like another... I had met with Matthew Warchus yeah. during Hair in New York and had sort of like a chit-chat about this idea of ghost. It wasn't really an audition. It wasn't really a, a meeting. It was like a hybrid. Yeah. I didn't know what it was, but I was like, oh, that was interesting. And then I fell off my radar. We went to London with Hair. Um, had this amazing summer in London, all 35 of us. Wow. And <clears throat> David had been on tour with Mamma Mia for about two years. And when we got the offer to go to London, he left the tour of Mamma Mia and we just moved in together for the first time in London and like let that be this European adventure for us, which was so amazing. And, um, and then the last, I think it was actually the second last day, right before I closed hair, I went and auditioned for Ghost. They sent me two tracks, two of the demo tracks, and one of the songs they sent me, I was like, oh, I don't know about this song. And then the other song they sent me was with you. And I was like, oh, this is, yeah. this is a song. And I was like, I got to go sing for this, even though I was about to go on a six-week backpacking adventure with David. And my head was elsewhere. <laughs> it was like, the last thing I want to do is audition right now. But, but, you know, you have to say yes to the opportunities. And so I went in, and I had this killer audition. I sang the crap out of this music that I was like, wow. Dave Stewart and yeah. Glenn Ballard wrote some real rock tunes. And I had so, so much fun. And then I went on this crazy trip to Morocco and the south of France and Croatia and Greece with David. And then I got a call while we were in Greece saying, so you got the part. Can you come back and read with a couple Sam options? And you're moving back to London. It was That's like, like the best phone call on a trip, right? Yeah, it was the best, except we yeah. had just gotten engaged. And I was like, <laughs> I'm in Santorini. I have a ring on my finger. My parents are here. Our parents came out and joined us in Greece. And I was like, and I got to go back and read with you. But also like, yeah, I want to go like do a brand new show yeah. written by rock stars in the West End. Okay. What kind of prep do you do at the theater when you get there? So I'm someone that needs some quiet time. Yeah. And... Um, you know, every actor is different with their sort of pre-show rituals, but I like to check in with everybody. I like to see my friends, visit people's dressing rooms, have them come to mine. But about an hour before the show, at 7 o'clock, my door is closed. I have some chill music on. I, the lighting is just so, keeping it low, keeping it cute. And, um, and I have some time to myself to think about the show, to warm up my voice, get in the shower, do some steaming. Yeah. Um, and like I said, I like to warm up in pockets because I find that that keeps me warm throughout the day rather yeah. than just like blasting it out pre-show. Um, and I find that that like makes me feel the most grounded before I go on stage because Elsa, it's such a big ask, this role. Yeah. You know, it's funny. Some of my friends have come to the show and said, well, it seems really well 
placed, paced out because you're on stage singing a huge number and then you're off for a minute and then you're on again and then you're off. And they're not wrong, but my costumes are so intense that they're so, so, so heavy and they require a lot of finagling because I'm moving mic packs around them. You know, the mics interfere with the beating and so we've got to wear them on my legs and then in my head and then the back of my bra and then on the outside of the costume, the inside. So I'm often, when I'm off stage, I'm not sitting and chilling. Yeah. I'm doing all my backstage choreography and it's a lot. So it's nice to have those breaks to recalibrate a little bit and like think about, okay, where's Elsa at? What's happening? But it is a, once, once the show starts, it's like a runaway train. If you could sum up the best part of the experience, let's like say this is such a challenging role for you, the emotions you go through yeah. in this. If you could sum up the best part of the experience of doing Frozen and being a part of this incredible world, what is it for you? I think in, in addition to the people I've met and worked with who have been totally dreamy on stage and off, the, the main thing for me that I've taken away is how wonderful it's been to play such a fantastically written role and something, a role that I can really flex my muscles in, that I can show all the sides of myself. Um, there's even a little bit of humor there, a brief moment when I get to play my scenes with Patty where we get to be joyful and laugh and I get to have a few jokes and we get to see Elsa's dry humor. I even get a little bit of that and then I get the vulnerability and the strength and the wisdom and the grace and I get to show these colors that I don't think I've ever gotten to show that much in any one role and so I feel like it's been a really awesome showcase for me and I feel like people are seeing what I can do and I'm very grateful for that because I've been in this business a long time and doing Broadway shows for a decade and I really feel like I've paid my dues and now I've been given this gorgeous role to play and I will never take that for granted. Yeah. Adina Manzel even gave you the thumbs up. Didn't she, she like meet sweet. her? Yeah. Talk about a full circle moment. Yeah, I went to see War Paint and yeah. she was there. Another show about yeah. strong women. And uh, and I just couldn't, you know, I couldn't not say like, yeah. hey, what's up? I'm gonna play Elsa. <laughs> and she was so nice about it. Yeah. Um, and actually what's funny is that night, I think it was like a Thursday, and I went up to her at intermission. I said, hey, like sorry about you. Because you know people were circling and just mm. like gawking at her. So I didn't want to be one of those, but I was. And um, and I said, I just want to let you know I'm, I'm going to be playing Elsa. And she said, oh, that's so great. How do you have the night off? And I was like, um, well, we haven't started yet. And she said, did you say you're playing Elphaba? And I was like, oh, no, I've actually played that already as well, but I'm going to play Elsa. So she was like, oh, okay, I understand. And she was just so sweet and said, you know, that she wishes me all the best. And I said, you know, you're voice is in my ear you uh you were the template you were you know you created the original magic and she was like oh please i'm just the voice you're going to be the person playing her which was awfully kind and unnecessary of her to say frankly but i really it meant a lot to me i mean starting out as maureen yeah i didn't tell her that i thought no. she'd think i was a stalker so i was like i'm gonna leave that one off the list <laughs> my final question is what is the best bit of advice that you've been given that you live by hmm. my mom has given me really good advice always. She has always said, Casey, there are the same number of hours in every day, and when things seem insurmountable, you have to trust in that, that the time will pass, it will be okay, and you have to take a breath. She always says, take a breath and exhale. And I've really, as I've gotten older, now that I'm a mom too, and now that I've worked this much in this, in this crazy world of ours on Broadway, I, it's the thing I come back to the most, probably, is a pause. It's like taking a healthy pause, taking a little step back for a minute when things feel crazy, and even when things feel crazy wonderful, just to like check in with yourself and not get too carried away, because it's so easy when you're in the entertainment world for your ego to get totally insane and to take on other people's energies all the time, try to please people all the time, try to be the thing you, want, you think they want you to be. And there's just no way of, of ever achieving that. And when I feel that, that ego ticking up a little bit, I remember, like, this is not just about you. This is yeah. a community effort. It's why we all got into theater in the first place. It's not a solo endeavor, you know. There are other people there with you to support you, to share this with you. And so if you can just take a breath and appreciate what's going on around you, it'll mean more. And I think that's, that's the number one piece of advice that always comes back. That's beautiful. Like I said, I have followed your career from the very first day you got here in New York. You've always been really kind to me. But I just watch your star rise. So well deserved. Like I said, you're so wonderful at what you do. Have the best time across the street. Actually, right next door to us here yep. at the St. James. I'm going to head right there after this. Okay. <laughs>